you look at that? I said, my friend, what you looking at? I think she is something for me. Excuse me, miss. It's my first time here. Maybe you could show me out of here. I think she got something in me. So please forgive my rudeness if I'm tripping over your time. But you look so amazing. And we Got something, every good thing comes to an end. At least it always happened to me. I'm telling you this now. You don't need to worry, cause I got this all down. And we get all together. And we can be so much more than who we are. So much more than who we are. We can, we can. Thank you, uh, Joshua. Thank you very much for that. That was unexpected and I uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, thank
Hello everyone, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and thank you for joining me this evening. Let's see, before we start, is there any echo? Are there any problems? I can turn off my 9 p.m. start because guess what? It's 9 p.m. and we have started. So, yay, progress! All right, let me just take a look here. Since the stream is on a delay, I need to wait a second to see some feedback from you when it actually goes. So while I'm waiting for that, this afternoon there was a, uh, an opinion that was posted to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals website. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals covers California, covers YouTube, and so this, this ruling could potentially affect YouTube and anybody who uses it. This <clears throat> ruling was in the, uh, sounds great, thank you very much. This ruling regards uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act safe harbor provisions uh, as opposed to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act notice and takedown that everyone's familiar. But uh, these, instead of using the takedown provisions, this, this company uh, issued uh, or filed a lawsuit against LiveJournal alleging that there was lots of copyright infringement going on on one particular forum on LiveJournal's site. And uh, the lower court, the district court, said that LiveJournal was uh, themselves in a safe harbor, kind of like YouTube is in a safe harbor from copyright infringement when they respond to takedowns on, on the YouTube site. Uh, in this case, LiveJournal isn't so lucky because the, 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 the photographer, the, the company sued LiveJournal, they appealed the district court's ruling, and today the Ninth Circuit disagreed and overturned the lower circuit's ruling. And so let's go over all of that and the rather large implications that this will have if this uh, becomes, uh, well, if it, well, it is good law now, but if it stays good law. The case is called Mavericks Photographs, LLC, versus Live Journal, Inc. Uh, thank you very much, Kristen, for the... Uh, <laughs> for the six dollars and uh, thank you very much um, who was his name here I've got to go all the way back up to Joshua Kane uh, I did say it before but uh, now that the live stream has started I wanted to thank you for the twenty dollars as well all right so the forum believe it or not was was uh, live journals most popular forum according to the this this writing um, the oh no you didn't or oh no they didn't forum uh, o N T D is what it'll be referred to in the in the court documents here. So, here's the the court here's the court case Mavericks for uh, photographs Live Journal appeal from the United States District Court Central District of California uh, appeals or at least this appeal was heard what we call uh, on on bank on bank I think uh, a three uh, three panel uh, circuit or, or three panel. Uh, Three panel panel, three judge panel, excuse me, is what I'm trying to say while reading too many things. I'm going to skip the summary because that gives us all the juicy details in way too short of a summary. And we'll go straight to the opinion. Plaintiff Mavericks Photographs appeals the district court summary judgment in favor of defendant Live Journal. So that tells us right away that Live Journal made a motion for summary judgment claiming that they were in the safe harbor and that they were granted that motion, they won the lower case. The district court held that the Digital Millennium Copyright Act safe harbor protected Live Journal from liability because Maverick's photographs were posted on their site at the direction of the user. And that's key language, at the direction of the user. To be eligible for the 512C safe harbor, Live Journal must show that the photographs were posted at the direction of the user. Although users submitted Maverick's photographs to Live Journal, Live Journal posted the photographs after a team of volunteer moderators, led by a Live Journal employee, reviewed and approved them. So not quite the same thing as as YouTube. This had actual moderators that that were actively involved, at least according to the court. Whether these photographs were truly posted at the direction of the user, or instead whether LiveJournal itself posted the photographs, depends on whether the acts of the moderators can be attributed to LiveJournal. 
The issue we must decide is whether the common law uh, of agency, common law doctrine, I guess common law of agency, I don't know if that's a typo or not, applies to Live Journal's safe harbor defense. Uh, we'll go over agency in a little bit, uh, but agency is the legal relationship between, say, an employer and its employees with respect to how its customers perceive the organization. When you call customer service and you have a dispute over your bill, does that employee, is that employee you're talking to an agent of the company and do they have the authority to act and bind the company to the things that they say? That law uh, is really not necessarily one specific written down uh, code of laws, but rather a, the, the common law that was built up over court cases and then restatements of court cases, as you'll see. The, uh, the district court ruled that the common law of agency does not apply to this analysis. We disagree and conclude that it does. As there are genuine factual disputes, we reverse the summary judgment ruling. Summary judgment uh, is a certain standard. You must have no outstanding issues to dispute at court. And so the judge uh, or the, the panel is going to say several times throughout this that uh, they, they did find that there was reason to hold a trial or, uh, or, or not grant summary judgment. Because the district court ruled on remaining elements, we also proceed to discuss those elements. Finally, we vacate the district court's order denying the discovery of the moderator's identities uh, because the agency determination may affect that analysis. LiveJournal is a social media platform. Among other services, it allows users to create and run thematic communities in which they post and comment and content uh, and comment on content related to the theme. LiveJournal communities can create their own rules for submitting and commenting on posts. LiveJournal sets up three types of unpaid administrator roles, moderators, maintainers, and owners. Live Journal protects various uh, protects against copyright infringement through various mechanisms. It follows the formal notice and takedown procedures outlined by the DMCA by promptly removing infringing posts and prohibiting repeat abusers. Live Journal's terms of service instructs users not to upload, post, or otherwise transmit any content that infringes on any rights. Oh, no, they didn't. ONTD is a popular live journal community which features up-to-date celebrity news. Users submit posts containing photographs, videos, links, and gossip about celebrities' lives. ONTD moderators review and publicly post some of these submissions. Uh, thank you, Gregory, for the... Uh, Sir Gregory Groda for the 50 Swedish kroner. And I missed the earlier one from Christian Aro Rasmus, Rasmussen, thank you. Thank you for great and interesting content and taking the time to do these live streams, appreciate that. For example, one rule instructs users, wait, did I skip something? I skipped something. Other users engage, here we're starting here. Other users engage in conversations about the celebrity news in the comments section of each post. For example, one of the ONTD posts at issue contained photographs that Mavericks had taken in which she, uh, the, it appeared to show that super celebrity Beyonce was pregnant. Uh, just a quick note, I don't think the court had any reason to put super celebrity in there unless the court really believes that she's a super celebrity. So there you go. The Ninth Circuit thinks that Beyonce is a super celebrity. Users speculated that Beyonce was indeed pregnant. Like other live journal communities, ONTD created rules for submitting and commenting on posts. The rules pertain to both potential copyright infringement and substantive uh, guidance for users. For example, one rule instructs users to include the article and pictures in your post. Do not simply refer us off to another site for the goods. Another rule provides keep it recent. We don't need a post in 2010 about Britney Spears shaving her head. ONTD's rules include a list of sources from which users should not copy material. The sources on that list have informally requested that ONTD stop posting infringing material. 
ONTD has also automatically blocked all material from one source that sent them a cease and desist letter. ONTD has nine moderators, six maintainers, and one owner. ONTD users submit proposed posts containing celebrity news to an internal queue. Moderators review the submissions and post or publicly post approximately one third of them. Moderators review for substance, approving only those submissions relevant to new and exciting celebrity news. Remember we were talking about like the heart of the, the fair use content and whether it's a fair use to repost stuff when you, when you usurp or take over the market for the, for the existing work. Moderators also review for copyright infringement, pornography, and harassment. When, the, when ONTD was created, it was operated exclusively by volunteer moderators, but then it grew in popularity to 52 million page views per month in 2010 and attracted LiveJournal's attention. ONTD is LiveJournal's most popular community and is the only community with a household name. In 2010, LiveJournal sought to exercise more control over ONTD so that it could generate advertising revenue from the popular community. LiveJournal hired the then active moderator, Brendan Delzer, to serve as the community's full-time primary leader. By hiring Delzer, LiveJournal intended to take over ONTD, grow the site, and run ads on it. As the primary leader, Delzer instructs ONTD moderators on the content they should approve and selects and removes moderators on the basis of their performance. Delzer also continues to perform moderator work, reviewing and approving posts alongside other moderators. He is paid, expected to work full time. Other moderators are free to leave and go, work when they see fit. In his deposition, the general manager of LiveJournal's office, Mark Farrell, explained that Delzer acts in some capacities as a sort of head maintainer and serves as an elevated status to the other moderators. ONTD has no primary leader, according to Delzer himself. Mavericks is a celebrity photography company specializing in candid photographs of celebrities in tropical locations. Can we say paparazzi? <clears throat> The company sells its photographs to celebrity magazines. According to Mavericks, infringement of its photo photographs, <laughs> photographs is particularly devastating to its business model. Of course, for journalism. Since Mavericks photo photographs break celebrity news, such as the pregnancy of Beyonce, infringing posts on sites like ONTD prevent Mavericks from profiting from the sale of photographs to, uh, to celebrity magazines. Mavericks filed an action for damages and injunctive relief against LiveJournal, alleging copyright infringement on the basis of 20 Mavericks photographs posted to ONTD, in seven separate posts, seven separate posts between 2010 and 2014. Some of these photographs contained either a generic watermark or a specific watermark, featuring Maverick's website, maverick'sonline.com. To the best of his recollection, Delzer did not personally approve the seven posts. LiveJournal has no technological means of determining which moderator approved any given post. Mavericks did not utilize LiveJournal's notice and takedown procedure to notify LiveJournal of the infringements. When Mavericks filed this lawsuit, LiveJournal removed the posts. So there we have Mavericks didn't use a DMCA notice and takedown procedure and they just went straight to a lawsuit. And while there's no requirement that you'll do that, you see that you'll see later that the court does take that into account. During discovery, Mavericks also filed two motions to compel responses to its interrogatories seeking the identity of the ONTD moderators. The magistrate judge denied the first motion and the second motion. Um, uh, based on the First Amendment right to anonymous internet speech. Okay. LiveJournal moved for summary judgment on the basis of their safe harbor. The district court granted LiveJournal's motion and denied Maverick's cross motion for partial summary judgment on its uh, items. Maverick's appealed. Two. We review de novo, a district court's grant of summary judgment. Well, what a cryptic phrase. It just means that they're starting over. It just means that they start brand new. De novo means brand new. 
uh, we must determine, viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the non-moving party, whether there are any genuine issues of material fact and whether the district court correctly applied the substantive law. Another extremely cryptic phrase, if you don't know what those magic words mean, they're talking about the summary judgment standard. Remember that summary judgment is before a trial. You're asking a judge to rule on the entire case without going to trial. You're saying that you've got enough filed with evidence and argument and testimony that you don't need to go to trial. So when that happens, the judge has a certain standard to apply. It's whether or not there are any genuine issues for trial. We call them genuine issues of material fact because material facts are the, the main facts, the important facts, the germane facts. And so if there are genuine issues of material fact, then you cannot rule on summary judgment and then you need to go to a fact finder um, this is the difference between legal and fact. Legal is the procedure and application of the law. Uh, fact is what happened. And oftentimes the facts are not clear. And so you have to go to a fact-finding hearing, otherwise known as a trial. And so this trial is either with a judge called a bench trial or a jury trial. And either the judge in a bench trial or the jury in a jury trial literally determine what facts are true. And there are still some standards for how much they're allowed to use to do that, but as long as they're doing it within the within the law, the what the jury says stands, what the judge says stands, except that it can be challenged on appeal, and there are also rules about how things happen on appeal. The district court's denial of a motion to reconsider the magistrate judge's discovery order will be reversed on the standard of clearly erroneous or contrary to law. So Mavericks will get its chance to re-argue its, its request for the identities of the moderators if it can show the lower court uh, was clearly erroneous or ruled contrary to law. Um, if you ever wanted some DMCA background, here you go. The DMCA strikes a balance between the interests of copyright holders in benefiting from their labor entrepreneurs in having the latitude to invent new technologies without fear of being held liable if their innovations are used by others in unintended infringing ways, and those of the public in having access to both. This from the Columbia Pictures v. Fung case. They're going to cite that later, so that's where that came from. The DMCA balances these interests by requiring service providers to take down infringing materials when copyright holders notify them of the infringements and by limiting service providers' liability for unintentional infringement through several safe harbors. The DMCA established four safe harbors to provide protection from liability for one, transitory digital network communications, two, system caching, caching, Three, information residing on systems or networks at the directions of users. And four, information location tools. LiveJournal claimed protection from its damages under C, uh, 512C, the safe harbor for infringement uh, of copying by reason of storage at the direction of the user. Safe harbor from the infringement by reason that the infringing content was placed there by the user, not by LiveJournal. Maybe through the operation of LiveJournal's website in allowing them to post, but a human didn't have interaction. Uh, well, you'll see. Let's just keep going. Section 512C1 provides, in relevant part, a service provider shall not be liable for infringement of copyright by reason of storage at the direction of a user of material that resides on a system or network controlled or operated by or for the service provider if the service provider does not have actual knowledge that the material or an activity uh, using the material is infringing, in the absence of such actual knowledge, is not aware of facts or circumstances that, the, that make the infringing activity apparent, or obtaining such knowledge or awareness, once, uh, once obtaining such knowledge or awareness, acts expeditiously to remove or disable access to material. So there you go. Those four paragraphs are the heart of the DMCA safe harbor for YouTube, for Reddit, for 
just about any content or any site, excuse me, any site with user generated content. If you meet these threshold requirements, the service provider, okay, excuse me, I, I read ahead uh, with the rule. Um, so the court goes on to cover the lack of actual or what they're calling red flag knowledge, which is known or should have known. Actual knowledge is known. Red flag knowledge is should have known, as in there were facts that you should have been aware of that were so clear to you that you should have known to look further into this. Um, also that it did not receive a financial benefit directly attributable to the infringing activity in a case in which the service provider has the right and ability to control such an activity. Because the safe harbor is an affirmative defense, Live Journal has the burden to establish beyond controversy of every element and failure to establish that burden will render Live Journal ineligible for safe harbor protections. So I wasn't kidding when I said this was really important. If Reddit's moderators reach this level of direction from Reddit's owners, then Reddit is at this kind of mercy. If, if this can happen to LiveJournal, it could, it could happen to YouTube. I mean, uh, does YouTube moderate it? I don't know. Maybe we'll have to see some details about exactly how YouTube moderates their content. But what about a channel owner? Um, you know, they're definitely going to fall outside of any safe harbor. Uh, so how far does this go? Let's keep going. Live Journal must make a threshold showing that Maverick's photographs were posted on ONTD at the direction of the user. The district court held that although moderators screened and publicly posted all of the ONTD posts, the posts were at the direction of the user. The district court focused on the user's submission of infringing photographs to LiveJournal rather than LiveJournal's screening and public postings of the photographs. A different safe harbor protects service providers from liability for the passive role that they play when users submit infringing material to them. The 512C safe harbor, however, focuses on the service provider's role in publicly posting infringing material on its site. Contrary to the district court's view, posting rather than submission is the critical inquiry. And that comes from the Perfect 10 v. Giga News uh, case. Um, wow, which was also apparently just decided. I need to go read that case too. We're going to be going over Perfect 10 eventually. That's, I didn't even know that was decided yet. Okay. So from the Perfect 10 case, Distinguishing between the service provider's passive role, the case distinguished between when the service provider's passive role, uh, when users upload infringing material to the servers, and any sort of active role on the basis of who caused the images to be displayed. In the context of this case, that inquiry turns on the role of live journals moderators in screening the post in screening and posting users' submissions and whether their acts may be attributed to live journal. Mavericks, relying on the common law of agency, argues that the moderators are LiveJournal's agents, making LiveJournal liable for the moderator's acts. The district court erred in rejecting this argument. That's not my opinion, that's the Ninth Circuit's opinion. The Ninth Circuit is saying that is wrong. The LiveJournal moderators could be agents and it was wrong of the district court to hold that they were not agents. Now, the, the, the Ninth Circuit is stopping short of saying that, they, that, the, that LiveJournal is liable. They're saying that LiveJournal could be liable. And let's continue, and, and we'll see. They're going to clarify this more, and so they're going to send it back to the lower court. Um, but these de the devil's in these details here. Uh, statutes are presumed not to disturb the common law, meaning copyright doesn't override common law legal doctrines about agency relationships, etc. Pursuant to this principle, the Supreme Court and the Ninth Circuit have applied common law in cases involving federal copyright law, including the DMCA. The Supreme Court has applied the common law of agency in interpreting the Copyright Act. We have applied the common law of vicarious liability in analyzing the DMCA. 
We have also applied the common law of agency to determine a service provider's intent to infringe under the DMCA in Fung from before. Along with other courts, we have applied agency law to questions much like the question of LiveJournal's liability for the moderator's acts. We applied agency law to determine whether a service provider was responsible under the DMCA for copyright infringement by its employees. The Tenth Circuit applied agency law to determine whether a service provider was responsible under the DMCA for copyright infringement by its contractors. Finally, a district court applied agency law to determine whether a service provider was responsible for the acts of its moderators in Columbia Pictures v. Fung. We therefore have little difficulty in, hold, in holding that common law agency principles apply to the analysis of whether a service provider like LiveJournal is liable for the acts of the ONTD moderators. In light of the summary judgment record, we conclude that there are genuine issues of material fact as to whether the moderators are LiveJournal's agents. The factual dispute is evidence when we apply common law agency principles to the evidentiary record. Here's agency for anyone who's wondering what common law agency is. Agency is the fiduciary relationship. A fiduciary relationship is a relationship of responsibility. So there's some kind of responsibility between parties here. Agency is the fiduciary relationship that arises when one person, a principal, manifests assent to another person, the agent, that the agent shall act on the principal's behalf and subject to the principal's control, and the agent manifests assent or otherwise consents so to act. This comes from the restatement of agency. This is a, if you're not familiar with law, this is a funny book. Every once in a while, um, a, a bunch of very, very well-educated people will get together and try and summarize the law, like summarize everything that's changed since the last time we summarized it. In this case, they wrote a book about summarizing agency law. It, here it was re released by the American Law Institute in 2006. It is the third time that, I think that's what that means, the, the, the restatement third of agency means it's the third release that they have, that they have tried to summarize agency law. And so anyone who wants to know all about agency law can buy this one book and go read everything you ever wanted to know. And the sources are usually so well researched that lots of courts, including here the Ninth Circuit, are relying on this book, even though this book is not law. For an agency relationship to exist, an agent must have authority to act on behalf of the principal, and the person represented must have a right to control the actions of the agent. An agency relationship may be created through actual or apparent authority. So we're going to go over that, but this means that you can be an agent through several different means. Actual authority arises through the principal's assent that the agent take action on the principal's behalf. Uh, okay, so that just means that you just you, you literally have explicitly said you're my agent and, and I'm your principal and please go do this on my behalf. Kind of like an employee and an employer. Live Journal argues that it did not assent to the moderators acting on its behalf. However, Matrix presented evidence that Live Journal gave its moderators explicit and varying levels of authority to screen posts. Although LiveJournal calls the moderators volunteers, the moderators performed a vital function in LiveJournal's business model. There is evidence that LiveJournal gave moderators express directions about their screening functions, including criteria for accepting or rejecting posts. Unlike other sites where users might independently post content, LiveJournal relies on moderators as an integral part of its screening and posting business model. LiveJournal also provides three different levels of authority. Moderators review posts, etc., etc. Genuine issues of material fact therefore exist as to whether the moderators had actual authority. Going on, apparent authority arises by a person's manifestation that another has authority to act with legal consequences for the person who makes the manifestation. When a third party reasonably, reasonably believes, reasonably believes, that's a tough one, the actor to be authorized and the belief is traceable to the manifestation. Okay, that's a tough one. That's a lot. I'll short, short, shorten this up. Apparent authority is when a third party has legal reason to think that an agent is a genuine agent and not some 
random Joe. So maybe not when you're walking through Target and you see somebody in a red top and khaki bottoms and you say, hey, do you work here? That's not necessarily apparent authority. But if that person then turns around and says, yes, I work here, and now you're starting to get closer, maybe that's still not apparent authority, but you're still getting closer to apparent authority. And now what happens if you and that person made some kind of agreement that, et cetera, et cetera. So the principles manifestations. So the person giving the agency. The principles manifestations or actions giving rise to the apparent authority may consist of direct statements to the third person, directions to the agent to tell something to the third person, or the granting of permission to the agent to perform acts under circumstances which create a reputation of authority. So I highlighted that third part because I think that's the one that we're going to focus on. Live Journal selected moderators and provided them with specific directions. Mavericks presented evidence that Live Journal users may have reasonably believed that moderators had authority to act for Live Journal. One user whose post was removed pursuant to a DMCA notice complained to Live Journal, quote, I'm not sure, excuse me, I'm sure my entry does not violate any sort of copyright law. I followed ONTD's formatting standards and the moderators checked and approved my post." Un end quote. The user relied on the moderator's approval as a manifestation that the post was complied, that the post complied with copyright law, and that the user appeared to believe the moderators acted on behalf of LiveJournal. Such reliance is likely traceable to LiveJournal's policy of providing explicit roles and authority to the moderators. Accordingly, genuine issues of material fact exist regarding whether there was an apparent authority relationship. Whether really an agency relationship exists also depends on the level of control a principal exerts over the agent. LiveJournal presents, excuse me, I'm skipping, evidence presented by May Matrix? Matrix? Evidence presented by Mavericks shows that LiveJournal maintains significant control over ONTD and its moderators. Delzer gives the moderators substantive supervision and selects and removes moderators on the basis of their performance, thus demonstrating control. He also exercises control over their work schedules. He added a moderator from Europe so there would be a moderator to work while other moderators slept further demonstrating control over the moderators. The moderator's screening criteria derive from rules ratified by LiveJournal themselves, also further demonstrating control. On the other hand, ONTD moderators are free to leave and go and volunteer their time in any way they see fit. In addition, the moderators can reject submissions for reasons other than those provided by the rules, which calls into question the level of control that LiveJournal exerts. This evidence raises genuine issues of material fact, regarding the level of control that LiveJournal exercised. From the, evidence, from the evidence currently in the record, reasonable jurors could conclude that an agency relationship existed. We turn briefly to the related issue that the fact finder must resolve in the, the event that there is a finding that the moderators, excuse me, I'm totally butchering that sentence, we turn briefly to a related issue that the fact finder must resolve in the event that there is a finding that the moderators are agents. In that event, the fact finder, remember this is the judge or the jury, depending upon how we have our trial, the fact finder must assess whether Maverick's photographs were indeed posted at the direction of the users in light of the moderator's role in screening and posting the photographs. Posts are at the direction of the user if the service provider played no role in posting them on its site, or if the provider carried out activities that were narrowly directed towards enhancing the accessibility of the posts. Accessibility enhancing activities include automatic processes, for example, to reformat or perform some technological change, some manual service provider activities that screen for infringement or other harmful material like pornography can also be accessibility enhancing. Indeed, Section 512M of the DMCA provides that no liability will arise from a service provider monitoring its service or affirmatively seeking facts indicating infringing activity. The ONTD moderators manually review submissions and publicly post about one-third of the submission, 
The moderators review the substance of posts. Only those posts relevant to new and exciting celebrity gossip are approved. The question for the fact finder is whether the moderator's acts were merely accessibility enhancing activities or whether their extensive manual and substantive activities went beyond the automatic and limited manual activities we have approved as accessibility enhancing. Because the district court focused on the user's submission of Maverick's photographs rather than on ONTD's posting of the photographs, and because the district court rejected Maverick's argument that unpaid moderators could be agents, the district court erred in granting summary judgment. Genuine issues of material fact exist. We remand. Remand means they're going to send it back for rehearing at the lower court in accordance with this new ruling. The, new ju the, the, the original judge will read this ruling and, and rehear the case, ha uh, having taken this court's directions into account. Once the district court concluded that the moderators were not Live Journal's agents, it proceeded to address the two remaining disputed requirements for establishing the 512C safe harbor defense. One, lack of knowledge of infringements, and two, lack of any financial benefit. Because these issues may be contested on remand, we proceed to address them and to provide guidance to the district court. So the Ninth Circuit could stop here and could say, go on, go ahead, district court, and do your thing. But they're, they want to be clear. Why do they want to be clear? They're hoping that there aren't any more errors, I guess. If LiveJournal shows that it meets the threshold for a safe harbor because the photographs were protected at the direction of the user, it must also then show that it lacked both actual and red flag knowledge of the infringements. Actual knowledge refers to whether the service provider had subjective knowledge, while red flag knowledge turns on whether a reasonable person would objectively know of the infringement. Um, actual knowledge would be do I literally know? Did I see the infringement and am I, do I understand this is infringement? And then objective would be should I know upon seeing something like submissions of mavericksphotography.com watermarks that don't come from Mavericks Photography, should I know that that's not a thing? So that's what they're talking about. Both actual and red flag knowledge refer to knowledge of specific infringement alleged. On remand, the fact finder must first determine whether LiveJournal had actual knowledge, a copyright holder's failure to notify the service provider of infringement through the notice and takedown procedure, as Mavericks failed to do so here, strips it of the most powerful evidence of actual knowledge. Such evidence is powerful, but not conclusive, towards showing that a service provider lacked actual knowledge. The district court held that LiveJournal lacked actual knowledge. This was an incomplete assessment of the issue. To fully assess actual knowledge, the fact finder should, should also assess a service provider's subjective knowledge of the infringing nature of the posts. Although Delzer does not remember approving the posts for this reason, and for this reason can be said to lack actual knowledge, Mavericks has not had the opportunity to depose the moderators to determine their subjective knowledge. On remand, the fact finder should determine whether LiveJournal, through its agents, had actual knowledge of the infringing nature of the posts. In the event the fact finder determines the, that LiveJournal lacked actual knowledge of the infringements, it must then assess whether LiveJournal lacked red flag knowledge, Red flag knowledge arises when a service provider is aware of facts that would have made the specific infringement objectively obvious to a reasonable person. The infringement must be immediately apparent to a non-expert. Some of the photographs at issue in this case contained either a generic watermark or a watermark containing Maverick's website, maverick'sonline.com. To determine whether LiveJournal had red flag knowledge, the fact finder should assess if it would be objectively obvious to a reasonable person that material bearing a generic watermark or a watermark referring to a service provider's website was infringing. Finally, 
if the fact finder determines that LiveJournal met the 512C safe harbor threshold requirements and that LiveJournal lacked knowledge of the infringement, then the fact finder needs to determine whether LiveJournal showed that it did not financially benefit from infringements that it had the right and ability to control. We agree with the district court in IO Group v. In the IO Group case, that the fact finder should consider the service provider's procedures that existed at the time of the infringements when assessing a service provider's right and ability to control the infringements. The fact finder should consider the service provider's, service provider's general practices, not its conduct with respect to individual infringements. Right and ability to control involves something more than the ability to remove or block access to materials. The service provider does something more when it exerts high levels of control over activities of users. The service provider exerts high levels of control, for example, when it pre-screens sites, gives them extensive advice, provides, prohibits the proliferation of identical sites, provides detailed instructions regarding issues of layout, appearance, and content, and ensures that celebrity images do not oversaturate the content. This coming from the Perfect 10 case. Yet another Perfect 10 case. The district court concluded that LiveJournal did not have high levels of control such that it had something more than the right and ability to remove or block access under this standard. LiveJournal's rules instruct users on the substance and infringement of their posts. The moderators screen for content and other guidelines such as infringement. Nearly two-thirds of the submitted posts are rejected, including on substantive grounds. ONTD maintains a list of sources that have complained about infringement from, you, from which users should not submit posts. LiveJournal went so far as to use a tool to automatically block posts from one source. In determining whether LiveJournal had the right and ability to control infringements, the fact finder must assess whether LiveJournal's extensive review process, infringement list, and blocker tool constituted high levels of control to show something more. LiveJournal must also show that it did not derive a financial, uh, a financial benefit from infringement that it had the right and ability to control. In determining whether the financial benefit criterion is satisfied, courts should take a common sense approach. The financial benefit need not be substantial or a large portion of the revenue. In the phone case, we held that a financial benefit was shown when there was a vast amount of infringing material on the provider's website, supporting an inference that the service provider's revenue stream is predicated on the broad availability of infringing material, thereby attracting advertisers. On the other hand, the service provider in that case promoted advertising by pointing to infringing activity and attracted primarily visitors who were seeking to engage in infringing activity. And that is mostly what occurred on that service provider's sites in Perfect 10. LiveJournal derives revenue from advertising based on the number of views ONTD receives. Mavericks presented evidence showing that approximately 84% of the posts on ONTD contained infringing material, although LiveJournal contested the validity of this evidence. The fact finder should determine whether LiveJournal financially benefited from the infringement. Mavericks also challenges the motion to compel. The denial of its motion to compel responses seeking the identities of the moderators. The magistrate judge denied both of Mavericks' motions and on review the district court upheld the denial. Reasoning that the moderators had a First Amendment interest in internet anonymity. When a district court denies reconsideration of a pretrial discovery order, our review is deferential. That means that, that there's a, a legal standard for, for giving uh, deference to the lower court. We will disturb it only if the complaining party shows clear legal error and actual and substantial prejudice. So not only an error, but that the error had a negative effect and a substantial negative effect. In determining whether the First Amendment protections for anonymous free speech outweigh the need for discovery of the identities, we have applied a multi-factor balancing test. You can see that in In Re Anonymous Online Speakers, uh, 661 F3rd at 1174 to 76. Notwithstanding the deferential standard of review, and complex issues of law that govern this discovery ruling, we vacate 
the, the district court's order denying the motion, and we remand for further consideration. Whether the moderators are agents should inform the district court's analysis of whether Maverick's need for discovery outweighs the moderator's interest in anonymous internet speech. Given the importance of the agency analysis to the ultimate outcome of the case and the importance of discovering the moderator's roles to that agency analysis, the district court should also consider alternative means by which Mavericks could formally notify or serve the moderators with process, requesting that they appear for their deposition at a date and time certain. So that means that the, that the live journal moderators could be brought not to court, but to a formal deposition for court, and likely they could be done, it could be done anonymously, where Mavericks would know who they are, but would be under a court order not to release their identities to the public. And finally, for the foregoing reasons, we reverse the district court's grant of summary judgment to Live Journal, vacate its order denying discovery, and remand for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. Reversed vacated and remanded. And that is the end of their opinion. We won't know what the actual outcome is with the Live Journal case until the lower court now rehears all of those things that this, this court complained about didn't get heard and decides how those things should be heard. And if Mavericks or if Live Journal have a huge problem with how that got decided, they get to appeal again. What I anticipate may happen, much more likely, is that these parties will now settle the case because it's pretty clear what Live Journal is going to be subject to. So I want to hear your questions now. What do you think of this opinion? And what do you think of Live Journal's case? Do you think Mavericks has them? Do you hate the fact that the paparazzi might be right here? Uh, Am I being too derogatory by calling them paparazzi? Do we, do we know that they're actually really nice photographers who take the time to obtain these uh, celebrity photographs nicely and peacefully? They don't get up in your face and act like jerks? Or I don't know. Is that just my personal opinion on not liking that kind of activity? Um, let's see. I think, I think, I think we have some backroom stuff. Yes, I'm aware that the video and the audio aren't perfectly synced. I really have no idea why they aren't perfectly synced, because... Oh, because there's a hundred millisecond delay programmed into this. God. <sighs> okay, so yeah, somehow there was a hundred millisecond delay into the audio. I'm sorry I missed that till just now. Hopefully that's not too... Um, that wasn't too annoying for all of you. <laughs> but that was, that was the big question. <laughs> all right. What does this mean for my community-moderated aggregation site? Uh, thank you for the question, NS Nick. Um, this means that you, if you have a site that has this kind of active community moderation and you're providing guidelines you're probably going to need to really review this opinion. You may even need to consult with an attorney to make sure that you are still well within your safe harbor uh, as with regards to these, these new things. Uh, basically, the, the, the level of your control and involvement um, is going to determine whether you're in the safe harbor. It almost seems like you might need a more hands-off approach in order to fall within the safe harbor and that a hands-on, carefully tailored and moderated community, which may be a very nice community, but that's much less likely to be in the safe harbor if, you're, if, if that level of control hits what these judges are talking about here. I, I also was surprised to hear that LiveJournal was still a thing. I'm not knocking them, I just never used it, and it apparently it's turned into kind of a news aggregator site, in this case ONTD seems to be their, their largest forum, and it seems to be more about posting uh, 
celebrity celebrity pictures and stuff. Avster Bone, thank you for the uh, $2. Love your copyright stuff. Also, what happened to the FUPA? Best of my knowledge, the FUPA is still alive. The last I heard from the FUPA, uh, I wrote to them on behalf of a client or two that I couldn't take. Uh, they had written back and said that the FUPA was, was in full swing, but was also very saturated and very, they were extremely busy and uh, already the attorneys involved had more business than they could possibly handle. So I don't know what the, what the status of the FUPA is. I do have, uh, I did recently make contact with uh, Ryan Morrison and maybe I'll be meeting with him in the next few weeks and maybe I'll have some answers and can answer some questions then. Uh, it's also quite possible that, that there's a reason why the FUPA is not something that we talk about. So maybe I won't be able to say anything there. Consider this my canary. If I never say anything about it again, then it was the second thing. How would that affect something like Discord, where there are many servers that each pick their own moderators? Well, what we're talking about here is whether Discord then would be liable for the copyright infringement. If Discord isn't the one creating the moderators and all that, then Discord would still be within their safe harbor. If if Discord starts to create moderators that come around to your Discord server or channel or whatever and moderate your content, then they're looking much closer to this live journal case. If I saw my face on the live journal site, I get weirded out every time I see myself posted someplace. Uh, I, I'm not used to this sort of minor internet fame. And uh, it, it's, uh, even when people in my, in my own normal circle of friends say, hey, I saw your video, I, I, I do a double take. I'm like, what? People actually, hmm, yeah. So Cyberpunk, I have started to look into the CD Projekt Red trademark on Cyberpunk. I don't know what it is. Is they literally have a trademark on Cyberpunk as it applies to video games? Or they have it on, uh, they have a trademark on Cyberpunk something, Cyberpunk 2016 or something like that. Uh, thank you, Cerulean. The audio is now synced up, apparently. The uh, 100 milliseconds must have been the thing. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, what's, uh, any news from the Bible Reloaded guys? Yes, they, they released a, a video a week ago or so, or, uh, 10 days ago. I haven't watched it, but my understanding is that they did explain many things. Uh, whether you agree with what they're doing is, is up to you. How would this affect sites that have specific teams to control and police content such as Twitter? It could affect Twitter. If Twitter has active content moderators and they don't, they have either actual knowledge of copyright infringement and don't take it down, such as a DMCA takedown notice or something, uh, or they find infringing content and don't take it down, then they could be outside the safe harbor as well. Now, the Ninth Circuit here made a big deal about how Mavericks bypassed the takedown system and never sent a notice to LiveJournal and never sent, never had the stuff taken down and that LiveJournal did take the stuff down immediately upon receiving notice of the claim, and in this case the lawsuit. So the fact that maybe, maybe that will come into play in the lower court's analysis and maybe the other court won't have a problem with that and, and maybe that will be some kind of mitigating factor. The CD Projekt Red trademark on Cyberpunk was explicitly stated to be solely on the use of the word cyberpunk in the title of video games and not in general. A as it would have to be, that's not necessarily a benevolence on the point of CD Projekt Red. You would have to do that in order to get the trademark on cyberpunk in the first place. It's, it's just a normal uh, pro uh, part of trademark law.
is the game any good? I didn't, I don't I didn't even know it existed. Uh, yeah, so if Reddit has active moderators, this is going to apply to them too. And guess what? Reddit is also based in California, if I recall correctly. So, and I did look it up. I looked up YouTube's terms of service, and YouTube subjects you to the law of Santa Clara County in California. So, good luck. Uh, this applies to all of that. If the, Reddit, if the Reddit moderators are too active in moderating content, have too much instruction, then they will cross the line and Reddit will no longer be in its safe harbor. And you could just imagine this could open the floodgates. I hope it doesn't, but this could open the floodgates for litigation from basically copyright trolls who have been waiting for the meme economy to be taken down and them to get paid for every use of your Bill Murray meme or your Maury Povich meme, etc. So I hope that that's not the result, but this is not necessarily a nice ruling for anyone who's hosting uh, uh, user-generated content online. What do I think of the YouTube ad apocalypse? Uh, okay, so you all jumped on me last time I said anything about a conspiracy, but I kind of wonder. There's lots of other entities out there that would benefit from YouTube having less views and less advertising. Those, some of those enterprises and entities have conflicts of interest their media themselves. Imagine if Fox News or if Amazon or, uh, any, you know, any other, uh, DirecTV even, AT&T could do something. If, if In order to get views away from YouTube, you just have to make YouTube look bad. So you find some video that's arguably about extremism or whatever, and then you, and then you make a big thing about it and then people don't watch YouTube as much, except that we seem to be kind of a tight-knit community, and I know Jorg Sprav's channel, the Slingshot channel, and that's an amazing channel, and he's an amazing guy, and he's obviously not a terrorist, and so I'm hoping that this backfires instead, and advertisers realize how strong YouTube's community is, and why it's worth it to pump more advertising dollars into YouTube. At the same time, I don't want to see YouTube become only advertising. I just signed up for YouTube TV yesterday. I'm in the Philly market. This is really cool. Uh, however, I have immediately realized that I don't like live TV commercials. I, 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 no, no, I just, I want to watch my TV and when the commercials come on, just mute it automatically or something, or just don't show me commercials. I just hate it. I absolutely hate it, and I, I can't. I just cannot watch live TV because of the commercial breaks. That just totally breaks my immersion, and I'll go wait. I would rather just wait for the content to be available elsewhere. Uh, in the olden days, that might have been pirating, but I'm a lawyer now, and what a headline that would make. So uh, I don't pirate my content. If I can't watch something, I just simply don't watch it. Or if I really, really, really want to watch it, I will make a concerted effort to block the ads by muting them and not watching or something like that. Yes, his video update was great. Yeah, DVR forever. Uh, YouTube TV does have DVR functionality, so maybe I can use that to skip commercials. I haven't played with it yet. It's also $35 a month. And I'm an AT&T subscriber, and as an AT&T Unlimited subscriber, I have to have DirecTV. So I already have many live channels through DirecTV now, and I don't want those. It's, they're, they're nuts. They're nuts with all this bundling. H3, H3 news, Greg. Greg Gillis. I know a different Greg Gillis. Um, H3, H3, I'm hoping that there will be an update within the next week or two. The judge said that she's waiting for Matt Haas's reply. He was given a chance to make one extra reply and to submit a DVD or video or something, and he hasn't submitted that yet. So I don't know if we're waiting on that. It seemed, it's been more than three weeks, so he should be submitting that or not, and then the judge should be issuing her decision. 
she's also in the middle of some kind of criminal trial right now. She told us all about that and how she didn't want that to interfere with the copyright trial. So it's very possible that that decision is coming as soon as she's done with her criminal trial that she's doing right now. <laughs> yeah, copyright lawyer admits to piracy in the past. Well, hey, you got to start somewhere. DirecTV plus AT&T shouldn't have happened. Hear, hear. I agree, especially now that I need to have both in order to get the one that I want. Uh, that's, that's just... It's a PG-13 channel, so I won't curse. Crap! Can I get a quick recap, Nox Kitsune? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Although Skeptic Sarah would like to have you just watch the whole video. Um, so, yeah, first off, let me say that a recap really won't be enough to get the whole thing, obviously. But basically, LiveJournal has an extra level, or their moderation is at an extra level, more, more, than, norm, more than what we would normally call moderation. They were given tools and guidelines about copyright infringement and things like that. And so the judges in this Ninth Circuit opinion have said that that might knock them out of the safe harbor. The judges have made some suggestions, which is, those are really strong suggestions coming from the Ninth Circuit judges, that maybe they really are outside the safe harbor and they have given guidelines and instructions to the lower court. The case got sent back to the Central District of California to be reheard by the same judge with these new guidelines. And uh, assuming that that happens and the parties don't settle the case, then those moderators get to go to depositions and the, uh, the, the a, a jury might get selected. We might have to hear arguments about whether, these, whether this moderation reached that level or not. You get one fuck per hour, I think. Okay, I'll take it. Hey, look. We're only an hour into the live stream. It's not a two and a half hour live stream this time. We're almost done, and it's only an hour. <laughs> Although I did start half an hour early. Pay for cable. I'd rather go outside. Exactly. Can I do a recap of the recap? Yes. Um, I spoke about how I spoke about something else earlier, and then I spoke about it in a short summary version. <laughs> uh, okay, so I don't know if you guys are up for it, but I'll go get the dogs if you want, and then we'll call it a night. And if you want to uh, talk more, we, you can join me on the Discord server where I'll be hanging out uh, this evening, and we can... We can either live chat, uh, uh, voice chat, or um, you can join me in World of Tanks, which I'm going to be playing a little bit later, too. So uh, do you guys want to see the dogs? I know it takes a moment for the, uh, for the live stream to catch up, so I'll just take a, an overt drink from my cup here. <laughs> can I have a recap of the recap of the recap? Yes, doggos. Okay, good. That did give me um, one minute. I'll be right back. Um, here, I'll put a song on.
Okay. So you should have music and my voice. I don't know if you can hear me over the music. Ilsa, hop. Hop. Come here. Stay here. Stay here. Say hi to everybody. Say hi. You got mud all over me. Here. I'll pick you up. Raw. Raw, my Ilsa. My big Ilsa. You smell terrible. You smell absolutely terrible. She likes to roll in everything. Oh, hang on. Let me take the thing off the thing. There we go. Oh, you want to get down. She doesn't like being held sometimes. You smell terrible. Raw. Here, go have another chicken. Okay, Nico. Come here. Good boy. Raw. And this is my golden, this is my golden boy who cuddles with me at night. What, what about the music ended? Okay, yes, the music ended, I'll, I'll, I'll play it for the out. Did I, I just inhaled his hair. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is, these are my favorite doggos. Yes, Ilsa needs a bath. She definitely needs a bath. He's a good boy. He sees himself on the screen. <laughs> All right, I'll um, I'll play some music for a couple minutes and then uh, we'll call it a night. Thank you very much for joining me for the live stream and uh, and I'll I plan on editing this down. It didn't happen to the last one, but I think I'll edit this one down and post the shorter version for everybody who doesn't want to watch 45 minutes of me talking about uh, me reading the case. So have a good night, everyone. Thank you for joining me. And I'm going to put this boy down. of 
Songs of tomorrow, I'm dying to know.